Hey, Ron here from Military Images Magazine. Thanks for joining me for a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. Today, I want to go back to July 18th, 1862, the summer of 1862, the second summer of the war. I want to take you down to the Ohio River along the border of Kentucky and Indiana. On that morning of July 18th, a band of about 30 Confederate raiders crossed the river and headed towards the little community of Newburgh. The man who was in charge of this group is pictured here. This man right here. He is Adam Rankin Johnson, a brash young Kentuckian who got these men together and decided to cross that river and check out the town of Newburgh. And when I say check out, I mean raid the town. He came in with a bit of a bluff. Uh, he took his men, a small, the small band of men, uh, sort of pushed them out a little bit and made them all big, look big on their horses, present a larger front. He also pulled together uh, a charred log and a stovepipe and created two guns. Those of you who study the Civil War are familiar with the concept of Quaker guns that date to about the spring of 1862 when they're used along the Eastern Theater. Well, here's an example of where they're being used in the West. So here is Johnson with his Quaker guns, one of charred wood and one of a stovepipe. He sets up these fake guns, he spreads his men out on the horses, and basically intimidates the town with this bluff. The bluff works. There are 80 convalescent Union soldiers at a makeshift hospital in town. They surrender. Johnson and his men come in town. They confiscate a bunch of supplies. They loot some of the homes. The whole affair lasts just a few hours. They take their captured treasure, head back across the river into the safety of their native Kentucky. So this is one of those raids that captured my attention because you don't really know much about it. We know about John Hunt Morgan's 1863 Ohio raid. We know about the St. Albans raid. Uh, in Vermont in 1864 from the Canadian border. But this is one of those small raids that tend to be forgotten. Though if you go to Newburgh, Indiana, you'll see a historical marker, one of those uh, markers along the side of the road that provides some basic details on the raid. I came to know about the Newburgh raid, as it came to be known, because I was researching this uh, General Johnson, he eventually became a John, he be, eventually became a general. He was, uh, as I mentioned, uh, from Kentucky with his men, born in Kentucky, but he had gone out to Texas before the war and become a surveyor. When the war began, he came back to Kentucky, grouped together some men, uh, did some scouting for the Confederate army in the area, and then led this raid on Newburgh. It caught the attention of folks. In fact, it made major newspapers, not only around the United States and the Confederate States, but also into European newspapers. So it was a big deal. One of these early raids and incursion into Union territory, it was quite the newsmaker, as you might imagine. Also, Johnson gets a bit of notoriety because of the brashness and the, the daring of his act. He winds up getting the attention of John Hunt Morgan himself, uh, belong, attaches himself to Morgan's command, joins Morgan on the Ohio raid. Those of you who are students of the Civil War, you know how the 1863 Ohio raid ends at Buffington Island. Most of Morgan's men are captured. Morgan himself is captured soon afterwards. Johnson is among the few men who escape. He leads 350 of his men away from the disaster at Buffington Island and makes it safely home. That action, along with Newburgh and other events in his 
adventurous life lands him a brigadier general's appointment. And then he goes on to create a force of about 1,700 men that are on the rolls. This is after Buffington Island, late 1863, early 1864. He takes his force of about 1,700 men. Those estimates may vary a little bit and goes on a new raid in 18, late 1864. During that raid near Princeton, Kentucky, is when he loses his eyesight. And you can see by the post-war picture here, wearing these goggles to cover up his eyes, you can see the, get a sense of the fact that he was totally blind. So I want to read to you uh, an account, two accounts actually, about the blinding, just to put the photographs in context. So here's the first one. And both of these, I should mention, come from his memoirs, which he wrote in 1904. And here's the detail when he talks about what happened to him. He says, uh, the Federals running toward a thicket, I dashed in front of 40 or 50 and called to them to surrender, which they did. He's talking about Union soldiers. I ordered them to face about and move toward the command, which was now coming up on the opposite side. These seeing Federals with guns in their hands opened fire on them. One of the balls struck me in the right eye and, open, and coming out on the left temple cut out both eyes. As soon as my misfortune was discovered, great confusion ensued. So what he's telling us is he was winning the day near Princeton, Kentucky, when he was surprised or reinforcements from the Union side came in, fired away, and that shot hit him. Then his command fell apart and everyone retreated. A little detail he doesn't mention is, in fact, it wasn't Federals that fired the shot. It was an accidental musket shot from one of his own commanders. So that makes you think about other Confederates that were accidentally shot and Union guys, but particularly one Confederate, in particular Stonewall Jackson. So there's Johnson having a connection to Jackson, the victim of an accidental shot. Jackson, of course, died as a result of his injury. Johnson went on to survive. So that's Johnson's account of his wounding. Now, here's what happens afterwards. Here's one of the men, one of his sub-commanders who finds him, uh, a man named James Q. Chenoweth. Chenoweth shares his memory of finding the badly injured Johnson. And he says, I was securing at another group of men that were galloping about the woods. An officer of the staff rode up to me and informed me that General Johnson was fatally shot. I was dumbfounded, said Chenoweth, and heartbroken. I was not so greatly upset by the confusion and demoralization around me. He's confirming Johnson's comment about after his shooting, everything began to fall apart. But, Chenoweth continues, the information that our leader had fallen quite extinguished the sun of every hope I had entertained of victory. After stripping my good charger of his harness and saddle, the steed I had captured, I rode with the officer to that part of the field where I found the wounded chieftain. The officers of his immediate staff had placed him in an ambulance where I found him as cool, dispassionate, and self-possessed as he was on the starless night before when he gave me his orders for the charge. I sat down beside him, myself speechless with distress at the unutterable calamity which had befallen us. But the wounded general, with a bullet hole through his temple, blind and suffering, lay calm and apparently unconcerned, except for the fate of his little army. He quietly bade me assume command as rapidly as possible, make my way across the Cumberland and Tennessee rivers. So there you have it. The story of Johnson's wounding, the memories of General Chenoweth, or one of his subordinates, Chenoweth, of General Johnson's wounding, which happened near Princeton, Kentucky in 1864. 
the end of his military service and in fact ended with him being captured and going to a Union prisoner of war camp in the north. He survived all that, was uh, sent back south in 1865 and lived into the 1900s. But that story of his wounding is just part of that larger story of the raid on Newburgh, Indiana in July of 1862. So there you have it for today. Life on the Civil War Research Trail. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you again. Till then, happy trails.